In the second part of our Lamentations, let us meditate on the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ from the time he was accused before the Sanhedrin until the moment when he was crowned with thorns. Let us offer to God the Father the wounds, indignities, and insults of our Lord Jesus in the hope that all nations may live in peace and harmony with one another, that Christian charity may rule in the hearts of men, and that true unity and lasting peace may reign in the world. Let us also offer our Lord's passion for ourselves to obtain the remission of our sins and of our punishments for them, and to secure protection against pestilence, famine, war, and all calamity.
Sacred heart.
from a chapter from Louis Chardon's book. All God's benefactions toward men have their cause and origin in his creative love. This applies even to the visible sending of the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits of the Passion of Christ. The coming of the Son of God, however, can have no other cause because no created being can merit either the principle or beginning of grace, nor can one merit the incarnation which is the source of this grace. The love of God alone is the cause of the incarnation. Jesus was produced, as it were, by the Holy Spirit as a work for which no other cause can be ascribed than love. As our Lord pointed out to Nicodemus when he wished to make him admire that grace, which is the basis of all man's happiness and the subject of Gabriel's message. Once this profound truth is accepted, we can see in its light that the sending of the Son of God upon earth is the perfect proof and is more than enough to convince us of God's great love for us. Without that necessity, which is the enemy of freedom, without any hope of profit, honor, or pleasure, he gave what was dearest to his heart. And because men did not know of this love, he wished to reveal it to them in an absolutely clear manner. If to love is to give, if to love much is to give much, if of all gifts there is nothing greater than to give oneself, and if of all things capable of giving themselves there is nothing greater than God, men will certainly have to confess that there is no better proof of God's love than his giving us his Son. Yet such was not the final proof. Jesus came to give in the nature he had taken from us. When Jacob made peace with Laban and raised up a stone as a witness to their mutual agreement, he assembled other stones around that one and called the whole the heap or the pile of the covenant. That stone was clearly a figure of Jesus, who is the true witness of the eternal friendship which God contracted with man in the mystery of the Incarnation. But as if this witness were not enough to impress upon our minds the greatness of his charity, he wished to be born only to subject himself to the rigorous necessity of dying. And because he is the origin and source of eternal life, he could not find in himself a cause of death, but had to seek it from the outside. He willed that terrible torments should violently tear his soul from his body when it was drained of the last drop of his blood. The birth and the death of Jesus were the two columns engraved with the most compelling proofs of his holy love. God so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son. God commends his charity towards us because when as yet we were sinners, Christ died for us. No one who attempts to judge these two venerable mysteries by standards other than the love of God could ever be persuaded of their truth. Jesus had been slain 
in his adult life, had he been slain in his early youth, or come into the world in another way than do human beings, we should have been deprived of all these goods. It is therefore no cause for marvel that the same weight inclined him to death and gave him the contrary inclination to flee and avoid it, that the same love which ravished him on the cross made him suffer its delay, and that if he chafed at not dying soon enough, he was careful not to put off the hour of his death in order to increase his sufferings all the more, thereby leaving us infinite proofs of his boundless love. He gave them to us from the moment of his conception in the womb of his mother, and during the nine months he lay there captive. He confirmed them by his birth in a manger, multiplied them again and again as he lived through the various stages of life encountering the many trials contrived by divine providence and by his own love with the deliberate intent of making him suffer in every possible way. What man could count his sufferings? Who could tell of his long fastings, imagine the warmth of his instructions? or do justice to his indefatigable care to realize the business of our salvation. No one can understand the desolation of his soul or the persecution launched against him by his own people or the number of interior crosses which incessantly made of his soul a cruel Gehenna The sands of the seashore and the drops of water in the ocean are not more numerous than were his sufferings. Dear God, how clearly that mountain of torments and sufferings testifies to your great love for us and reproaches us for our coldness and base ingratitude toward you. We can no longer remain ignorant of your holy love, bathed as we are by the bright light that floods the universe, igniting living flames capable of setting everything on fire. Louis of Granada once said that creatures were so many glowing coals by which we may experience the delightful warmth of their Creator. Will not the works and sufferings of Jesus produce in us that effect for which he came? I came to bring fire upon the earth and transform us into the same love which caused him to become man. The heavens announce the greatness of God by as many mouths as it has stars and the whole universe reflects the shining rays of his glory. But Jesus is a more lovely world than the one in which we dwell. All that the firmament contains of grandeur is truly nothing in his presence. Surely, then, his life and death will deeply impress upon our minds how much he loves us. Was there ever a love like that of Jesus? Has any man ever done for his friend what the Son of God has done and suffered for his enemies? We can no longer refuse our hearts to him, for he endured all things that we might profit by a knowledge of his love. He himself had no need of such things, but they would make us realize we should love him without reserve, as he truly loved us.
Blessed be God. 